I, I, I promise you, I'm just being obedient to the Holy Spirit. I feel like the word that the Lord gave me this week is for, for right now, for tonight. And, and I know you may have never thought of it, but the book of Deuteronomy is a breakthrough book. Some of y'all just said, what? The book of Deuteronomy is a breakthrough book. It's the last book before the people go into the promised land. It's a breakthrough book. And I believe there's a breakthrough message in the book of Deuteronomy. Are you, I, I want you guys like, come on. Like, I believe the Lord wants to do some stuff. He is doing things in our midst. The, the book of Deuteronomy is a warfare book. Jesus went to the wilderness for, for 40 days and 40 nights and the devil came to tempt him. And do you know what book he quoted three times to kick the devil's tail? Deuteronomy. Not only is Deuteronomy a breakthrough book, but it's a warfare book. It's, it's got something for us tonight. And I, I just want to share. I, and I, I don't know how long I'll share, but I believe that Deuteronomy has a word for us tonight. You ready for it? Can we just give God praise and just believe? Come on. He's going to do something tonight. You can, you can be seated if you can. If you can. If you're not already, thank you. Man, isn't this worship team the very greatest of all time that on, on his whim they were able to get ready for us? Let's just leave it down here tonight, brother. I want to spit on some people. Just kidding. Maybe. Maybe not. Hallelujah. If you want to look at a, a verse with me, come on. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 1, actually. And then you can thumb through, thumb over to Deuteronomy chapter 6 in a moment. Mm. I like being in a church where I can feel the presence of the Lord, and that's, that's the kind of church I find myself in tonight and this morning. Amen? And even on the live stream, people said they felt the Lord. Isn't that good? You know, you know uh, Sister Cheryl, I'm so glad that you shared that testimony because I was battling the whole time. I'm going to get up here and start speaking in tongues. I'm going to offend people because they're going to feel like it's out of order. But the Lord knew. The Lord knew. Uh, you know, I was, I was brought up a little bit old school Pentecostal where it was, you do not speak in tongues unless it's a message in tongues for the body. Like, and then if you were doing a prayer thing, like you could pray quietly, but it was never really an upfront thing. And so I struggle with that, but I guess the Lord knew better than I did, huh? All right, all right, you guys. Come on, say amen tonight. Amen. Don't stop worshiping now. So we hit the book of Numbers, and we saw that Numbers was a book of wandering, the people came to the edge of the promised land. They came right to the edge of their breakthrough. And, and they saw, yeah, this is a good land. God has something good in store for us. But we don't want to fight the battles it's going to take to step into what God has for us. And let me tell you something. There, there, there are good things that God has in store for us. Amen? Amen? Everything God has for us is good, but it doesn't mean it comes warfare free. It doesn't mean it comes without facing some giants. Now, I'm thankful that sometimes the Lord just drops things out of heaven, manna. He drops things out of heaven, and it's like, here you go. This is just a gift. But there are some gifts that part of unwrapping it means you've got to go into the land, and you've got to face some giants, and you've got to fight. And, and if you're unwilling to step into what God has for you, he'll say, okay, you don't have to have it. Well... Because the people decided they weren't willing to fight for what God wanted to give them, he said, you can have it your way. You're going to wander in the wilderness for about 37 and a half years. Well, that sounds like fun, doing circles in a wilderness. 37 and a half years. Some of you, your spiritual life feels like wandering in circles. And maybe tonight, by the grace of God, we're done with circles. And we can start stepping into the promises that God has for us. Amen. That's what I want. I'm, I'm tired of walking circles. I'm tired of doing laps around the wilderness when there's a promise that God has for me. So, so for 37 and a half years, scholars believe about 1.2 million people died off. 1.2 million people died off. That's 85 funerals a day. Seven people dying every waking hour every day. That's a lot of death. And it's meant to instill a little bit of fear of the Lord in us to go that 
there's a cost if we won't fight for what God has for us. Now, I told you in that message, in the message on, on numbers, they never stopped being God's people, but they didn't inherit God's promises. And I'm tired of watching God's people not inherit God's promises. I'm tired of watching people's dreams die, their hopes die, their faith die. They're making it, they're hanging on by a thread. I genuinely believe there's a lot of people, they're going to get into heaven, but they're not getting the promises that God has for them. And I, I want to be the kind of person uh, like Holly brought up, Caleb that had a different spirit, Joshua that, that God sustained him and kept him through so that they could inherit that, right? That's, that's who I want to be. And Deuteronomy comes to the transition where we go from Moses to Joshua. We get a people that are finally ready to step into what God has for them. It's a breakthrough book. And here's where it starts. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 6. I want to read this. The Lord our God said to us in Oreb, You've stayed long enough at this mountain. Boy, that's a prophetic word for somebody tonight. You've been here long enough, cowboy. I never say that, but it felt like saying, you've been here long enough, cowboy. Like, let's go, you know? Like, you've been, you, why are you still here? Do you ever feel the Lord just look at you and go, why are you still here? Why are you still struggling with this? Why are you still asking this question? Why are we still going, going laps around this wilderness? You've been at this mountain long enough. Turn and take your journey. Yes. Yes. I think there's some people tonight. You showed up on a Sunday night because you're ready to turn and take your journey. You're done with wilderness wandering. You're ready to go into and grab a hold of what God has for you in Jesus' name. Yes. So Moses is final act as leader is to call a new generation to remember their past, to remember who they are, and to remember their future. The book of Deuteronomy is a book of remembrance, and I'm telling you tonight that remembrance is a powerful tool in the hands of our God to prepare us to step into the, to the greatness that God has for us. Remembrance, remembrance, that word's used over and over again in the book of Deuteronomy. It's used over and over again in the scripture. Remember, remember. Stories of remembrance are powerful because they help us remember what God has done so that we can begin to move forward in our lives. Mm. I don't, I don't want to kill the mood in the room, but I, I have to share this example because I saw God use a, a remembrance in my life. Uh, two, two weeks ago, Glenn Blankenship asked me to do the funeral for his 25-year-old son, Chad. And so um, I said yes, because he's my friend and I would do anything for Glenn. And... Uh, preparing, I've never shared part of my testimony in a funeral before, but I really felt compelled by the Lord to share the reason why. I, I think it's the reason why I'm a preacher of the gospel. I think it's the reason why I got saved. And, and it's when, it, it's my first memory of death. And it's wild how God could use something so hard because it was, I, I had finished kindergarten and it was in July. Uh, my cousin, his name was Derek. He was about three years old. He was about three years old. He had been swimming all day in July. He came in from swimming, soaking wet. Uh, his dad is a car nut, a mechanic. And so everything's cars to him. And so he grabbed his mama's keys, found an electrical outlet, st stuck it in there, pretending it's a car, was electrocuted, and he died. And... That moment became the defining moment that caused my mom and dad to reach out to Jesus in their 30s. Up to that point, I remember being a little kid, but I remember, like, I, I remember things. I remember life before Jesus. I, I remember there being alcohol in the fridge. I, I remember things about before my mom and dad. I remember, I remember how they talked before they met Jesus. Now, y'all think, think Paula Douglas always been a church lady, and I could talk about her because she ain't here. But I remember <clears throat> before Jesus a little bit, okay? And, and so I, 
I was sharing in this message, and I felt the Lord. I, I've never felt the anointing in a funeral like I felt it when I started sharing this story of remembrance and saying God can take something tragic, and he can turn it around for good because he did it for me. My mom and dad got saved, and when they got saved, they got saved for real. It wasn't we come to church uh, you know, when we feel like it. It was if Brother Robert had the church open, we were there. You know, like they got that kind of saved. And because I was raised in the church, I'm here today because God used something bad and turned it around for good. And when I shared that story of remembrance, I know, I know, Glenn sent me a text and he said, thank you for sharing and reminding us of how God can take tragedies and turn them around for good. I needed to hear that. This book, the book of Deuteronomy, it's a book of remembrance. It's calling us to remember our past, to remember who we are, to remember our future. Now, doesn't that seem odd? How can you remember your future? You see what I'm saying? Like, your future is what's ahead of you. How can you remember your future? Well, you remember your future based on the promises that God has given you. Because God has given each of us promises where he says, I have a hope and a future for you. So we remember the promises that God's given us in his word so we can step into our future. And we do it by remembering what he said. Hmm. The, the Hebrew idea for future is interesting. Um, and, and to understand it, we have to compare two words in Hebrew. And then I'm going to get into Deuteronomy. But this is going to help us see how remembrance brings us into breakthrough. Okay? And, and so... I was reading a book called The Christ Key by Chad Bird, and he brought this up. And, and I, I want to read this to you because it's so important. I want you to get this. The Hebrew idea of facing forward is kadim. It means east, I believe. This way is east, right? <laughs> the hunter's like, oh, God, yeah, that's east, buddy. <laughs> He's like, oh, Lord. <laughs> east, okay? The forward is east. That was just part of Hebrew thought. But... It also means past or olden days. And that makes sense when you reflect on it. Because the past isn't actually what's behind us. The past is what's in front of us. The past isn't hidden, right? We can look clearly and see our past. Now, you may think that you can see your future, but you really can't. The only thing you can see about your future is the promises that God has given you. Okay? So... The word for, for facing forward is kedim. And the word for future, so kedim, it means east, it means front, it means past, it means olden days. And then the word future is akarit. That ch in Hebrew is like a, you know, like back of your throat. Akarit. But it also means back or behind. Just like we can't see what's behind us, we can't see the future it's hidden from us. It's on our back. Therefore, in the Hebrew way of thinking, we walk backwards into the future, remembering everything that God's done for us. And we can, we can step in faith because we know how God's been faithful to us in our past. Oh, man. You guys aren't saying amen because it was so good. Your mind's being blown. That's why. That's why, isn't it? The past is our eye to the future. We re when we remember what God has done before, when we remember you guys sharing those testimonies, when you start stirring that up and going, I know my God is faithful. It helps us step into the future. I, you, you know, like I want this thing in Ukraine to turn out good, but I'm going to step into my future full of faith and hope and love and joy and peace. And I'm not going to lose one night's sleep over it because I can see clearly into my past that God has been with me every step of the way. And I'm not going to let the enemy steal any joy from me. So Moses is preparing in Deuteronomy a new generation. It's time to leave the mountain. Let's go on the journey to move forward. And you do this first by remembering your past. You have to remember your past. We have to learn both good and bad from previous generations. And there's, I, I think in every generation, there's good to learn and there's bad things to learn. We have to learn lessons in the wilderness. 
If, if our forefathers wandered around the wilderness for 40 years and we don't learn one lesson from them, then we're a bunch of idiots. You know? Like, just straight up, we're dumb. Like, let's learn from them. They built a golden calf and it made God mad. Let's not do that. Like, learn lessons from the Lord. And then, so, so we have these previous generations teaching us lessons. And then we have the feasts and the holy days. That were to be days that reminded us, reminded the people of what God had done for them. So they were to celebrate Passover, remembering how God had delivered them out of Egypt. Right? They, they were to celebrate the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, and go out and for a, a, a week dwell in tents because they remembered how God sustained them in the wilderness as they lived in tents. Like, these feasts were to be reminders. Remember your past so you can step fully into your future. Remember your past. Hmm. And then secondly, we have to remember who we are. If, if we're going to leave the mountain behind, some of you are going to have to start believing new truth about who you are. Remember who you are. Each new generation needs old truth. Every new generation needs old truth. We need the same truth that one generation got so they could remember who they were. And so Moses goes through, and, and as I'm saying this, Moses is the one giving. He gives like three big speeches in the book of Deuteronomy, and in one speech, he's looking at a new generation, and he's saying, here's what your ancestors did. This is why they had to wander. They built a golden calf. They grumbled about God giving them food and drink in the wilderness. They grumbled against, learn from them. Learn from them. Okay? And then he reminds them of the feast days. Remember these things. But then he's also telling them, you've got you've to remember who you are. You've got to remember that all these laws have been put in place to show Israel who they're called to be. They're called to be holy because God is holy. And his standard hasn't changed under a new covenant. It's been reiterated. Amen. I know we've been talking about holiness a lot, but holiness is the ancient truth that a new generation needs. We need to know we're called to be holy so that a lost and dying world will be drawn to the holiness of the Lord. The beauty, the beauty of holiness is how the psalmist put it. The beauty of God's holiness. Holiness is not all rules and regulations. It's the beauty of God. It's what sets him apart from all the other gods. It's what sets us apart from all the other people that worship other gods. Holiness is beautiful. So remember who you are. The laws are there to show Israel who they're called to be holy. So in chapter 5, uh, Moses reminds them of the Ten Commandments. He reiterates the Ten Commandments. Chapters 12 through 26, we get the laws on holiness and worship and leadership and social relationships and justice. And then Moses gives, I think, the greatest tool to a new generation. He gives them the Shema. S-H-E-M-A, the Shema. And it became a prayer that the Israelites would pray at least twice every day. And it's in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now that word for one actually leaves room for, it's the same word for one that's used when it says Adam and Eve became one flesh. So it leaves the door open for the triunity of God. Okay, when it says one, it's not, it's not talking there's only one. There is one God. He exists as three persons though. And that word for one leaves the door open for that. Just so you know, that's a tidbit. The Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. The people prayed this twice a day. Why? They're making a confession about who they are. There are people who serve the one true God. They're going into a land surrounded by people that worship every God under the sun, every God in the, in the land, the trees, all of it. They're worshiping a pantheon of gods. And they, they are saying, we worship one God. And our idolatry may be different, but we still live in a world that's worshiping a lot of different gods. We just call them money and sex and power and greed. We just call them by a different name, but they're idols nonetheless. And we are called to be a people that say, we serve one true God. One true God. So they're making a confession about who they are. 
Some of you need to start, as a spiritual practice, begin to confess who you are in Jesus Christ. Google this, who I am in Christ. It will pull up 15 to 20 statements that are straight from the Bible that say who you are in Christ. I dare you, I dare you to start confessing those over your life for the next month and see what happens to your mind. See how it starts to transform you as you remember who you are. Because the devil likes to remind you of who you were. That's what guilt and condemnation is all about. Who you were. But the Lord's always looking at you going, I know who you are. You serve one God. And you love him. You imagine this confession. And I love the Lord my God with all my heart. With all my soul. And with all my strength. Now I'm not confessing it because I'm there yet. I confess it knowing that every day I, I, I am weak. And I don't love him as much as I should. But I'm going to confess that I love him with my all. Until one day I do love him with my all. I'm, I'm going to call those things which are not into existence in my life. And I, I'm not calling a car into my life. I'm calling a greater love for God into my life. And so I don't think he has any problem with it. I'm going to call James Douglas, you love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. You woke up today and your number one mission on this earth was to love him. And I'm going to confess that over my life. I'm going to remember who I am so that I can leave this mountain and go into what God has for me. Some of you guys need to do that too. Remember who you are. And it's all about listen and love. Listen to the Lord and love the Lord. You want to know how to grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus? Listen to the Lord. It ain't hard. It's not I listened to one very mature pastor say, here's how I've defined discipleship for my people. Hear and obey. That's it. You want to know what a disciple does? They hear the word of the Lord. They obey the word of the Lord. Because they understand their life is not their own. They've been bought with a price. And that price was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So how dare I live under what he's paid for me to live in? I am called to live a life worthy of the calling that I've received in Jesus. So I remember who I am. I listen and I love. I love the Lord. And if I love the Lord, then that means I love people. Now Jesus goes on. Jesus expands on this, or actually the, the, whoever the lawyer was expands on it. He's like, you know, here's what the great commandments are. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you got it, man. You're not far from the kingdom. Loving God is never separated from loving people. Why'd you guys stop saying amen? Because you know the same people I know. (laughs) It's okay to laugh in church a little bit. Come on. Remember who you are. Open door, church of God. Remember who you are. You're a people of love. And you're a people that listen. This is who you are. Don't live below it. If we want to step into our future, we got to remember who we are. And then remember your future. Remember your future. Now, this is, this is a hard thing maybe for some of us to hear. And it's tough. It's tough. All good things have to end. Listen, every Israelite, every good Israelite that ever lived looked at Moses as the greatest prophet who ever lived. That's how they viewed him. That's how the people viewed him. Every good thing has to come to an end. Ah, It's tough, but Moses has to die for the people to go into the promised land. You have to let go of what's been good in order to embrace your future. You guys don't want to hear me. You guys don't want to hear me say that people and practices and things that got you into one season isn't going to bring you into the next season. You don't want to hear me say that, but it's still true. Moses had to die. Joshua had to become the leader. There had to be a transition. People had to let go of the good to, let, to embrace the God. Does that mean, okay, they're walking into their future. Does that mean they ever forget how Moses led them, how Moses was righteous, how Moses was good, the great things? That, no, they never forgot what he had done. But they had to let go. They had to let go to step into what God had for them. And and Jesus said it like this. New wine requires a new wine skin. Now here's the thing about new wine skins. It it didn't mean it was 
a brand new wineskin necessarily. Some of y'all know about this teaching on the wineskin. That actually, uh, they didn't have Walmart Supercenter where they could run down the street and grab a new wineskin off the shelf. So this, this culture saved everything. And so there would come a time where wine had been in a wineskin for a period of time and it had been poured out and now it's an old wineskin. But guess what? You could make an old wineskin a new wineskin when you put it into the oil. And it was immersed in oil until it became soft and pliable again. And then new wine could be poured into it because it would expand with the wine when it got poured in. (laughs) So just because it's a new wineskin doesn't mean it's brand new. It's something old that gets renewed to carry something new inside of it. And, And there was a people. They had been led by the greatest prophet that Israel ever had until Jesus stepped on the scene. They had to let go of that in order to step into the newness that God had for them. Hmm. So if you're going to remember your future, you've got to remember that there's going to be things that come to an end. And you've got to remember, and this is a tough one, but you've got to remember that there's going to be blessings and curses in your future based on who you are. I know we want to leave that part out. We just want to read about the blessings of God overtaking us. But if we don't obey, if we don't listen and love, if we don't step into who God's called us to be, he's not going to reward us for disobedience, you guys. And and this is why the church in our hour is living so far beneath what God has for us. He's not going to bless our disobedience. He's not going to bless our prayerlessness. He's not going to bless our apathy. He's not going to bless... I was preaching good until I... Was that meddling? I don't know. He's not going to bless that, though. Supposed to be a revival message. I think it's, I'm feeling revived. I'm feeling good. But listen, Deuteronomy 28, and I'm, I'm getting done, okay? Deuteronomy 28, listen what the Lord says. If you are faithful, so if you hear, you listen, faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I obey, that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all the blessings shall come upon you. And she'll overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. I believe that he's still the kind of God that wants his blessings to overtake us. I genuinely believe that. I believe he wants his blessings to overtake our families and our businesses and our lives. And that doesn't always mean uh, physical prosperity. But it means that we have something in us that the world can't deny. That there's a blessing on our life that sets us apart and makes us different. But listen, every coin has two sides. Deuteronomy 28, 15 says, But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses are going to come upon you and overtake you. There's blessings and there's curses. And they're real. They're real. I've seen it. I've seen it in people's lives. I've watched people live under under the curse of sin because they just won't obey the Lord. Mm. Let me encourage you some more. Hallelujah. (laughs) I just read you what's in the Bible, didn't I? It it wasn't the Book of Mormon, y'all. It was just just in the Bible. (laughs) It's what it says. So we we remember, to remember our future, we got to remember that good things end. There's blessings and there's curses. And then we need to remember that there's a promised land. Do you still believe that what's in front of you is better than what's behind you? Because I do. And if you won't believe it for yourself, I'll believe it for you. I believe what God has in front of you is better than what's behind you. And I would say that to a person taking their dying breath. If their faith is in Jesus Christ, I would look them in the eye and I would say what's in front of you is better than what's behind you because you're about to see him face to face. The veil's about to be removed and you're going to be in his presence like never before. As good as, as it gets in this room, nothing will compare to the moment when the veil is completely removed and we're there. So I'm telling you, no matter where you are, I believe that what God has in front of you is better than what's behind you. And if we're going to step into our future, we have to start believing that. Here's the last thing. If the team would would come, 
I feel like praying a little bit, just a little bit. Man, you guys came out, you've worshiped, you've heard the word. But here's the last thing. Here's the last thing I want to say that I think Deuteronomy calls us to remember. Deuteronomy calls us to remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, the Lord says to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I've commanded him. Now, this prophet that was to come wasn't Joshua, but I don't think it's any accident that the next person that follows, that follows Moses has the same name as Jesus. Like we, it's Yeshua, like that Yeshua followed Moses and, and the next book that follows Deuteronomy, Joshua is pointing us to the fact that there is one greater than Moses coming. His name is Yeshua. And when Jesus came, he came as this prophet greater than Moses. And John tells us in his gospel that he only did what he saw the father doing and he only spoke what he heard his father saying. And because of this, Jesus, listen to this, because of this, Jesus, Most of us know that at the end of Deuteronomy, what happens to Moses? He dies. He dies. He doesn't go into the promised land. But 14 or 1500 years later, because of this Jesus, because of this prophet greater than Moses, 14 or 1500 years after Moses' death, he finds himself on the Mount of Transfiguration, right smack dab in the middle of the promised land. What the law couldn't bring to Moses, the, the grace of Jesus Christ brought to Moses. The law couldn't get Moses into the promised land, but the grace of Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration brought him in. And, and I, I believe, I believe that today, It's not legalistic obedience that brings us into the promise because I've known a lot of people that, man, they're way more obedient than me, but it's a legalistic thing. It's not a joyful thing. It's not a love-motivated thing. They're just doing it because that's what they're supposed to do. They're doing it because that's what they have to do. And there's a difference because grace-fueled obedience is so much different than legalistic obedience. Grace-fueled obedience brings us into the promises of God because grace-fueled obedience is love-fueled obedience. We don't obey because we have to. We obey because we get to because we've had an encounter with this one greater than Moses. And when we follow him and we listen and we obey, he brings us into the promises. And all of his promises are yes and amen. And what he's done for one, he can do for you because he's no respecter of persons. So if he's healed a body for one, he can heal your body tonight. If he's restored a relationship for one family, he can restore a relationship in your family. Come on. Are you hearing me? And so it's time for us to walk into our future, remembering everything that God has done for us, remembering our past and remembering who we are and remembering the future that God has for us. Because I am telling you, child of God, your future is greater than anything that's behind you. What he has in front of you is greater than anything that's behind you. Come on. I just think that there's some people that are ready to step in. They're ready to leave the mountain and step into what God has for them. Amen? And so I'm just going to invite you. If that's you, you say, you know what? And and you know, I had to preach this because Holly reminded me today. Today's the changing of a season. (sighs) Today's the first day of spring. And don't you know that the physical world always mimics the spiritual world, or the spiritual world, the physical world mimics the spiritual world, doesn't it? It's a season change. Are you hearing me? It's a season change. It's time to walk into a new season by the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why I had to preach this tonight. I had to. When Holly told me in the car, that man, today is the first day of spring, I went, oh Lord. A season's changed. And this word is a season changing word. Deuteronomy is stepping into the promise. Are you ready? Are you ready for a season change? To step into the promises and the fullness that God has for you? I'm just going to invite you to come. And let's just spend some time standing, worshiping on our knees, whatever you feel compelled to do. But can we just come together tonight as a church and say, Lord, we're stepping into it together tonight. We're believing that what you have in front of us is greater than what's behind us. I know it's crazy. We're looking back, but 
what, what's coming is better. What's coming is better. And I don't even know what's coming. But he said, he said, these blessings are overtaking me as I'm stepping into them by faith. I believe there's some people that are ready to step in by faith to a new season that God has for them. Would you come and let's just pray together as they sing tonight. Hallelujah.